Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another uh, recorded book discussion between Ann Arbor District Library and the NRA's Book Club. The book that we are discussing tonight is called Names for Light, and this is by Thierry Mio Kwa Mint. And um, before we get started, maybe we could just do some quick introductions. My name is Lucy. I work at the library and the library tech in the youth department but I also have the pleasure of doing a lot of adult events like these book discussions. A brief visual description, I'm a 50 year old white female with chin length brown hair, green glasses, a green sweater sitting in front of a wall of watercolors. Hi, I'm Christopher. I also work at the Ann Arbor District Library in the youth department and love doing as many book talks as I can or book discussions. A visual description for me is I'm a 50 something year old man with short brown hair, glasses, and a white shirt. I'm sitting in front of a uh, dreary basement wall. <laughs> Hi, folks. I'm Fatima. I am one of the co facilitators for the Unerased Book Club. I am a South Asian woman in her 30s with short black hair, and I am sitting in front of a digital. A uh, background made out of pink clouds, birds, and blue skies. And hey, everyone, I'm Sheila. I'm the founder and other co facilitator of the book club. And a visual description I'm a South Asian woman in my early 30s with glasses, hair pulled back, and a uh, red pink top on. And my background is a uh, scene, it's a scenery um, of a mountain. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Lucy. Um. Yeah, well, thank you guys for being here. And this book, um, I guess before we get started, we should mention is a, well, it's called a family history. So it's a memoir, but I would say that the form is um, somewhat unconventional. I, um, I think a family history is like a very accurate title. I didn't know or think about that as much <clears throat> until I got through like halfway through the book and I was like, yeah, this is kind of like documenting your family history as someone tells it to you, like you learn from your family members. So it reads very much like that. Yeah. Kind of shifts the memoir format. And, uh, the, the author is um, Burmese. Um, so from Burma, born in Burma, but moved to Thailand very early on and then moved to the United States at a young age. Um, so her, it, it's a really interesting exploration of what it means to be part of the diaspora, but have some still very emotionally strong ties to the region. Um, and to Fatima's point, it's, and Lucy's point, it's, um, it's not a clear depiction of, uh, events that happen. It is still, it, everything is, uh, kind of clouded by the facade that can be memory. Um, so there's a lot of oblique references. There's a lot of um, incomplete stories that are told, incomplete references, um, incomplete like links between family members. And um, I personally really enjoyed that. So this book was actually picked by one of our readers, our regular readers. Uh, it was suggested, and we we're like, yeah, like why why not try a new form? So when um, I dove into it, I was really uh I, a lot of people compared it to ocean Vong, and i actually found that this was a lot easier to read than ocean's work so um for me it was a lot flowier than than i guess the style of writing that's been compared to but i want to i'm going to put Fatima on the spot to talk about what her first impressions were um <clears throat> yeah i actually very much struggled the first like about 10 percent of the book um but primarily because it felt so vague um and <clears throat> there's like elements of magical realism or the just uh, confusion almost right like who are we talking about what are the relationships uh you know they there was a lot of reference to great grandparents and my great grandparents father or like there are a lot of familiar relationships without actual names being used and <clears throat> it took a while for me to orient myself to it but eventually like after about 10% of the way through the book, I was like, oh, okay, I'm starting to get to the rhythm of this. And it actually became a little more specific. Um, and I think that just kind of goes to like, how much did her parents know how, about their grandparents or, you know, and how much did they know about their parents and so on and so forth. So you can kind of see 
the details become crisper the closer you get to her generation. Um, and that made the book much more digestible and easier to read. But the first bit for me was a little bit of a struggle. Yeah. What did you both think? Um, I, I agree that it was like initially difficult to get used to the structure. There's a lot of white space, um, but I was so curious as to how it was being used. And I still am like, I why? You know, some paragraphs just come at the bottom of the page, some are at the top. Um, so I'd like to know more about that. Um, but one of the things that I really thought was interesting as I sort of read further was um, the author's use of, of narrative voice and how when she is relaying stories that were told to her from her family members, they're in first person. Um, and and it was confusing when she was like, my great grandfather said that my father, my grandmother said that my father said, and you're like, wait, do, but um, I think that that is the way you receive stories. And so that's the way you share them back. Like, here's what I heard. And then when she's talking about her own memories, they're in third person. And um, at first I was like, wait, why is she shifting? And then I was like, but that's the sort of the way, like memories are not linear and they're not usually complete and they're not always clear. And so I thought that, um, that use of, of narrative voice was actually really interesting and really helped convey sort of the, the fogginess and the ghostliness of her own memories. I misunderstood that, Lucy. I did notice the pronoun switch, but I noticed it happening uh, in Europe and the US, and I thought it was tied to location somehow, but I think that you're right. It, yeah, I, I, I just misunderstood that um, when I was reading the book. Uh, I, I, I really like that. And uh, Sheila, early, earlier you had mentioned memory and I thought that this book was so much more effective as a family history, thinking about memory in its kind of fractured form. It was so much more real. You know, if I, or maybe if anyone was going to give a family history, well, mine would be kind of very linear and there'd be a lot of gaps and it would miss the whole point of a family history. And I thought she was so effective in really getting to the heart of her own memories of her family and what it meant to have these relatives the way that she portrayed it in the book. Um, I really enjoyed it. and instead of wrecking this book and reading it over a long period of time, I picked it up yesterday and finished it yesterday. And I enjoyed it so much more that way. At first I thought maybe I need to write down all the family lineage and everything. And I just thought, no, she doesn't want me to do that. And I'm just gonna go with it and take it all in. And I enjoyed reading it that way. I also noticed that like at, towards the very end, she talks about like disoc disassociating from her body and how, and, and I was like, oh my goodness, what an amazing like literary technique to do that the whole book where you talk about your own experiences in the third person because you physically probably dissociated and then like towards the end, you mention it um then oh that sense of feeling displaced and not feeling safe or not being where you were you're supposed to be and um and, and yeah I thought it was such a cool like way to I don't know textually embody the literal experience of living a life that feels um yeah that feels so dissociative so I thought that was really really cool This is my usual question for, for for any reader, but what were your reactions to the references to um, contemporary history and contemporary politics and how they informed her family's choices? Um, I didn't, you know, I don't, this is not, um, I mean, I think like 
for me, Burma has been in, in the recent news, you know, um, in the past couple of years, even a little bit longer. Um, but besides that, it's not something that I know a lot about the region or the area or any of the history building up until now. I think we we got into it a little bit in um, Alex Wagner's book, Future Face, which we talked about in this because she was part of her family's from there. But um, so I found myself like personally having to look, going to try and look things up and find information about um, about you know the the area and the politics in a deeper way, or just so I can understand it more because there's a I think you included in the in the contextual links there was a brief history of, of Burma, but even that was was a lot of information um, in a short ish, you know, in a short time. So uh, I felt like there was a lot. I had a lot more. I have a lot more to learn. I was you know, and still am pretty ignorant about Burma. The only time I've heard it referenced is uh, Thai friends of mine who have very negative things to say about Burma, going back hundreds and hundreds of years, even to modern day times. And so that was my only, my only reference at all, really, to Myanmar or Burma. Um, and you know, but I, I appreciated her kind of stinging comments, um, you know, about the West and Britain and, you know, just I think in general about the West. Um, at one point, she makes a, a critical comment about uh, brown women who are being married off and don't have a voice and aren't and talking to a Western reader and aren't you glad now or something to that effect? Do you remember what I'm talking about? And I just thought it was interesting. She has, you know, such oftentimes critical things to say about Western culture, and that goes beyond the her talking about the invasions that her country has has gone through. Um, I occasionally wasn't quite sure how to feel when uh, she would be upset with people who would say something about her language or her culture, because she said that that implies that you have your culture that I'm not sharing in. And uh, but yet I wouldn't presume to take on another culture, you know. Anyway, I, I just appreciated thinking about it and being challenged by many of her comments about culture and politics and the history. Um, I also <clears throat> still don't feel like I know enough about Burma or Myanmar and it's incredible to think that within like just three or four generations like all of that has happened to talk about occupations from from British uh, from the British from like J Japan from like neighboring countries too, like being at war with neighboring countries and and then also the strife within the country the civil strife of like who's in control, you know, um, who is overthrowing home. Like it just, there's so much that was happening all at once. And it, it is a lot to take in and a lot of violence. And you could kind of see like why a lot of people <clears throat> were leaving. Um, like I'm familiar with some of the refugee things because like Bangladesh has been giving um, like space for the Rohingya population who've been like, had uh, who've been seeking refuge there um but again and and she briefly mentions that in just like one passing like I think in the entire book there's just one passing mention of it um and she also talks about how she's also and her family is not an ethnic um like uh, like an indigenous person from from that country um but yeah I was just a it it's still very stirring and I feel like we're not always gonna know partly because 
so much of the history is constantly rewritten or destroyed and so when she talks about how like oh the temples were all cleaned and you know we had this massive cleanup day but it was really to hide massacres and stuff like that um and then the other thing is like she does go into so much of the microaggressions that she faces um as someone from <clears throat> from Burma and realizing like other folks don't recognize her as such. And so all of the racial uh, microaggressions against her. And I'm just like, yeah, that is very, very exhausting. And you can like see the toll it takes on her as the, as the book progresses. Yeah. Yeah, I think to that end, um, like part of the, the microaggressions that she seemed to always be facing were like people wanting to explain to her almost where she was from or or um where they perceived her to be from and there's this one line that really um stuck out to me where she says whiteness is not a color or a race or an ethnicity but a construct of power the power to speak to tell stories not only about oneself but about other people and i thought that that one line like so well encapsulated so much of of the microaggressions that she faces is just other people white people in in this country being like well i don't understand where you're from I see you as this, so I'm going to explain to you, you know, what my perception is, and that's what I think you are. But I just thought that one line was very powerful, um, not only for this book, but just it, as a thought in general. Oh, absolutely. I highlighted that in the Kindle edition. Uh, I was like, oh, yes, uh, it encapsulates so much of what a lot of um, Asian American authors who are talking about Asian American identity in contrast to whiteness specifically, it really um, boils that down, which like tangentially brings up this question um, of when are we going to start seeing in mass Asian American literature um, discussing what it means to be Asian American against other types of um, minorities, whether it's Black, Indigenous, Latino, Arab, et cetera, like really figuring out how are we triangulating against each other and um, as opposed to against this overwhelming idea of whiteness but that's that that's just what that prompted for me um on the flip side of being a minority in the U.S. I thought it was interesting that she's Bamar so she's a part of the majority group in Burma and part of her family stories involve being in really remote areas which are not ever really covered by western media um if you, you might get Yangon and that's it maybe um and you might get the Rohingya, but you don't get any of the other ethnic groups or the their states or the the struggles or strife within those areas. Um, and um, uh, it was just like it was jarring for me because uh, like how are we then perceiving other ethnic groups, minority groups who are oppressed by the state through somebody in the majority's lens, the same way that we would critique potentially um, a white author discussing uh, Black culture. Um, I don't know if like if those parallels came up for you or if anything else came up for you when you were reading about those regions or their experiences in those regions. I was really curious about <clears throat> like how much, uh, how or where she might have been about other minorities within the country and the relationship between like Bamar folks and uh, and the other ethnic groups but she I think you know partly because of the context of the book being a family history it makes sense not to go into that side but I'd be so curious about trying to understand that as well because obviously like her her parents like even her grandmother like were educated, right? So that was one of the things that kind of surprised me because I think I'm so used to narratives where it is only the more recent generations that are educated, whereas the older generations are not as much, especially when they didn't immigrate at an earlier date. So for me, I've been wondering about that, um, where it's just like, yeah, there's a lot of privilege in your family. Um, if you think about it, from that lens and I wonder how that compares um yeah I was also thought that it was interesting that 
her family like chose to her parents chose to move to a rural area to do their duty to the country and how a lot of people just didn't show up and didn't do it those who were qualified to do so um which made me think about like the people who didn't even have that option who were living in country like in the rural areas and didn't have that option and probably couldn't have gotten a visa out anywhere you know like the reason why her father was able to leave was because he got a teaching position in Thailand like he was a professional and he could do that he seemed to imply maybe that all of her family members and her ancestors were Bamar. Uh, at least she didn't say anything contrary to that. And I just thought that was interesting too, that um, I, I just would have liked to have heard a little bit more maybe about that and how, what the internal makeup of the country is like. And if there's a lot of clash between different cultures uh, i i don't know i i but it's of course it's a family history so I, it's just that i'm curious now yeah um according to uh world population review the bamar account for around 68 percent of the population followed by the shun who are like 10 percent kain seven percent reckon four and overseas chinese is three percent so it is the majority, but not like an not like a super majority. Oh, yeah. It's interesting because like she's giving us her this family history, but it it can really only ever be the history or it is the history that was told to her. You know, I mean, um she is Burmese, but she has really no memory. I mean, a very few memories of living there. She didn't live there a very long time. Um, you know, then she doesn't feel American until she goes back, um, which I thought was interesting too. That um, so it's like I, I guess I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it's, it's like we can only get really what she has been exposed to through stories and through what her family told her about the region, unless unless there were bigger parts of the book where she went into like more what you were saying, Christopher, like, here's this history of this, but um, it's, it's just like, again, it, it turns me back to the form of the whole book of this, like this idea of this is a family history, but it's not a family history where I'm like taking these pages and pages and pages and pages of genealogy and going into, it's like, these are the stories that were told to me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. In that way, it has a very like distinct flavor of like oral history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm kind of triangulating all that. Sorry, Christopher, just something real quick, and then I'm happy to, to listen to you. Um, what, uh, what research or what body of work exists to triangulate everything she's learned? Like if you're from the UK and you hear stories about your family, it's super easy to figure out if what they're saying is based in reality, or you can look up the cultural references if you don't understand them. But if you're from parts of the colonized world where history has been pretty demolished, um, it's re really, really difficult to figure out what is rooted in truth, or are there other accounts available um, that kind of give body to what your parents or grandparents tell you, or even the um, the uh not mythological but uh conversations of ghosts or other uh fantastical aspects of bomar culture they're like at least doing a, a quick google search like taking a few minutes to looking very few things easily pop up um but like you look up anything about like witches in eastern europe or whatever and like tons and tons of books are out there tons of primary resources are out there and that ex that disparity in cultural capital or uh, documented and archived ca uh, cultural capital, huge asterisk there, um, means that we like as readers can never really know. And as an author, she can never really know. Since you mentioned ghosts, 
Um, well, this isn't really about ghosts as much as it is about coming back in other forms. What a fascinating part of the book, thinking about the family relations. Um, you know, at one point she describes how her eldest sister, no, sorry, her, her middle sister was her great grandmother, I believe, and why her middle sister and her grandmother always didn't get along, right? Um, I, I just thought it was, it was really interesting. And I wasn't always sure if she had put that in, um, as, you know, as part of her family history, uh, part of her actual, uh, history that she had been brought up with, or if that was just a relationship that maybe she was exploring, I, I, I didn't know. But it was so interesting to think about. You know, I think all of that really, it, it's, you know, family dynamics are complicated. And then to add to the family dynamics, like the other family dynamics of who you were before, you know, like she was her, her middle sister's husband, right? Because she was her great grandfather. Was she her great grandfather? Yeah. She, and so like they would have been married previously so does that affect their relationship and then like what you're saying with her her grandmother and her eldest sister and so you have your your current these times family relationships and and family dynamics are always you know a thing and then you're constantly thinking about well who were we before how are we relating and or like for her older sister to be her um brother yeah. right I just think that there there also must be added to that this kind of this weight and this pressure to be like, I am this person. So I'm, I'm a great grandfather. Like, what does that mean? What, what's expected of me or for the oldest sister to be like, I'm my brother who died. Like, I don't, I don't, I can't imagine what it does to a person to be carrying that around forever. And, and I thought like that part she had where she's talking about how she never put any marks on her body. She never got tattoos or piercings or even dyed her hair because she was waiting for this mark to come from this past life to like sort of authenticate her. Um, it's just something that I, I found really um, interesting in that I can't I just feel like that would be a big weight, but it's also what she knows and, and how her family is constructed. Is the, was the older sister the one who had the eating disorder? I can't remember. I think so, yeah. Yeah, it was just like the, I don't know, as you were saying, like the weight that it, you must carry with it, it was reminding me of that, like doing, I'm sure there are lots of factors, but one of them could be like almost becoming a ghost and disappearing, you know, through an eating disorder, like physically shrinking mm -hmm. yourself because uh, everybody is expecting you to be something else or is reminded of something else. Yeah. And also to like to that, even to take that further, like she, I think she believes that like the jars of, um, you know, vomit that her sister leaves around, yeah. they're, they're haunted almost, you know, so yeah. it is like part of this ghostly um, experience, but then also turning yourself into a ghost. And then her sister weaponizes it in a way, I don't like to use that word, but she does, you know, the way she um, uses her eating yeah. disorder to make her mother angry but also to pay attention mm -hmm. yeah. that was striking mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder like because she shares she she shares a lot of things about her family a lot of the traumas they've experienced but she also is really careful about drawing certain lines like she doesn't share her brother's uh, like family name or what they call um, and there are other things that she seems a little hesitant of I, I I didn't think that she was going to address the audience directly until she gets to that part and she does and, and I'm just like yeah she's having like this really intentional conversation with folks and um and I, I always, I always feel a ways about it because I'm a person who likes to tell stories and I'm, I'm always just like, 
a part of me knows that I would never delve into memoir writing or autobiographical writing because for me it's just like I think I would feel very guilty about writing about family members or people I know because I would just wonder what would they think of me and I would also be very like hyper or I am hyper aware of like my capacity to write read and write in English where my family doesn't and so like having that difference of power and like have it they not being able to access it and so I'm I don't know I uh I wonder if like how other people if they if you were to write an autobiography or a memoir like would you actually do it um because obviously these writers they take risks um, and some writers talked directly about it, like last month when we were reading the graphic me novel or memoir, um, she talked about how she got her mother's permission to do it, whereas uh, this one, we have no idea. Did she get permission? Do the people mentioned in the book, can they even read it? You know, um, yeah. I was surprised at the end of the book, I think in the the afterward or the Anyway, in her, her acknowledgments, she oh, does wow. talk about her family, and I. it seemed to imply that she had gotten permission, and I was surprised because it's sometimes a kind of unsparing view of her family. You know, it's not terrible, really, but, you know, talking about your sister's eating disorder, I think, is, you know, kind of out there. I don't know if I would give my sibling permission to talk about something like that. Um, so, but, and I, I appreciate, she must have had a conversation with her family about the things to include. I wonder if any of the, the white space, I mean, I don't, I'm just so curious about the white space because I don't really know what, you know, what it means, but I wonder if any of it, it signifies things that aren't included. I don't, you know, it's just, thought um I did like hearing her read from the book it's interesting because she she takes these intentional pauses where those spaces mm. are so they're very much definitely a part of the the um the narrative and I, I mean and I have no idea but that just thought just popped in my head that no that's a great interpretation of it because I know like that's how a lot of white space is also used in poetry right mm -hmm. um I think I kind of took it, I did, I, I was reading the Kindle version for a while, but then I do, did have the hard copy and I was looking at it and I was really surprised by that too. But then my mind was just like, okay, we're just doing short chapters and it's kind of like a blended something and I ignored it, but, um, but no, you make a really good point. It's almost like a journal that might've been blacked out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's very possible especially with the way things like jump around. Mm -hmm. I chose to think of the white spaces because uh, I only read the Kindle version. I didn't get a chance to get the the hard copy. Um, it was it was easier for me to imagine it as a visual representation of her life and thinking about where like in graphic novels, there's intentional white space or in photography where a photographer chooses to like omit part of the overall scene in crafting um, a specific narrative for us to consume. Um, but then I also have the entire time visualizing what she was saying, kept thinking about um, like, you know, the filters um, on Instagram or what, or any other photo app that blur out everything else mm -hmm. around. Um, and I don't think it was so we could focus in on one specific aspect or like the, the main point of that paragraph or that vignette. I think it was to remind us that there's so much more that we're, we're never going to see um, or never going to have fully flushed out. And if uh, to go along with like photo analogy or metaphor, like you have a photo, you have a central image, but the blur is also over the central image. You're not supposed to be focusing on what, like on that specific um, story. It's, I, I love that my brain just kept thinking like, oh, what about like, what's happening in this remote state or uh, what's going, like, I want to know more about the mother and why, like how 
she felt throughout the, like, I want to hear her stories in completion. Like we know that she was derailed from her, her goals of getting degrees or, or matriculating out and how she must have felt. And there was a brief mention of the amount of depression that she went through when they got to the United States. And I would have loved to understand that um, at the same time. Like, yeah, there's just so many things about how the stories were presented. Like the the short vignettes about the first serious partner that the author had, um, incredibly oblique. I didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> um, and it's a, 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 the the partner is only referred to in they pronouns. Um, so I made the assumption that it was a queer relationship of some sort. But maybe it wasn't. And maybe we're not supposed to know either way and just keep an open mind about what their uh, the author's experiences were like, just trying to have relationships in a country where, to Christopher's point earlier, she's never really seen as part of our fabric either. Also, I really wanted to know what went down with the aunt that kicked them out of the house because I was just like, I can we please? But no, she didn't go into it, which I'm like, okay. Yeah. That also to me feels like a very familiar immigrant narrative of like moving in with your families before before you're like resettled. Yeah. Um, did this book spark any memories or reflections in your families or about your family storytelling? I think it made me think about um like the way in which I think of you know, my own, like, you know, family stories and what's been told to me, but also like how you, um, you only can ever know what's, I mean, you, not that you can only ever know, but you can look further, but you, you do take these st stories of what happened to your family and you hear them and you digest them. But there's also certain things that like, I think in my own family, like I've heard all my life, you know, the same, like, um, point or or story about someone in, in my family or something that they went through sometimes it's used to like make a greater point or to teach a, a lesson or um impart some sort of wisdom like that but also that the, um like I think the the I guess like Sheila used sort of oblique but you know the like memory for me I don't it's not there's not something that's sharp and, and clear and um I do think that that's it made me think about why there are certain parts of my life that I remember more, you know, why you remember something more clearly than others, whether or not it's been told to you or you experienced it. Um, it's like talking about that, that first relationship and how that's, that's so, you know, um, oblique. but I think that like, there are things like that, like, you're like, oh, I was with this person, but I, I remember it or I don't want to remember more of it than this or, um, so I, it just made me think about ways to tell a story, a personal story. And I, I think that, you know, with memories and family, um, once a generation is gone, boy, there's nobody left to ask about anything. I mean, you've, you've just lost an entire body of, of received family history and it's gone. And I, I think about that a lot, how, you know, it just very, very quickly becomes a giant question mark. And um, also uh, earlier, I don't, someone had said something about, um, you know, families and memory, even going back to recent family history, there are disagreements on who did what, and not even talking about great grandparents just recently. And I think it's also just fascinating how we can't even get that part of the story straight when people are still around to talk about it. I completely agree with you on that one. And it's like one of the thoughts and perhaps it's unfair of me to think it is um that I don't know if I would trust anyone's version of the story because uh, I I've heard so many things over the years and then like 
a little bit later, I'll get like a new perspective and I'd be like, wait, what? No, this like completely changes how I initially thought about it. And so it's just like every perspective feels so self-serving in a way that it doesn't feel. Um, yeah. So I'm like, I don't know. I'm mistrusting of it. But also as someone who like I've spent my entire life obsessed with this question of like history keeping and memory keeping because I didn't have a lot of it. So like that's part of the reason why I like started journaling in the fourth grade. I keep I've like kept I am the person who keeps all of my family photos and the letters and the journals and anything that I can get my hands on for family histories. You know, I had um these old negatives that I like got in Bangladesh uh 20 some years ago and uh, and you know they're like partially eaten away by bugs and also like melted together by um heat and humidity and I would do and I just like I was like I'll take them I'll still take them and I I did it I couldn't get them developed here in the states but I just carried them around with me for 20 years of like moving around until just a few weeks ago you know found an app that will develop your negatives just by taking a picture of the negative itself and so I finally got to see those photographs after 20 years but I am that person who like meticulously collects and preserves any bit of information because everything um everything it feels like everything before me was like verbal or oral it wasn't written down it wasn't documented in other ways you know like my grandmother doesn't know when she was born right like we don't have a date of birth because there are home births and and things like that I don't have an exact date of birth for my mom either so it's just things of that nature where I'm like yeah it's so important for me and so I so I have all of that and I'm like starting to create it for the for I guess future generations but um but I don't know if I would trust anyone in my <laughs> current family to give me the full story it would just be I imagine like if I if it were to be a memoir it would just be multiple versions of the same story told a few times and that would be interesting too it's okay yeah. So I have two reactions to what everyone's spoken about. The first is um, in the author's, uh, part of the author's lore or family lore is, uh, we've talked about this, but how um, each, like when a person's born, they might be a version of a, a family in the past. But if you don't have um, a written down story, you kind of are free to reimagine. Um, and you're, um, kind of free to just like maybe ignore it ignore like the parts that aren't nearly as uh endearing and then also um there's something interesting about um oral history cultures that are really strong in oral histories and what potentially harmful or negative aspects of family history just get left out completely or um just never really or like you just lose your history because there's so much baggage that it's better to have nothing than to have the full truth. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear it. My child is screw positively screaming her head off, like super happy out there. So I've <laughs> I'm glad that it's very happy distracting to me. <laughs> um, I can imagine that's distracting. Um, but I, one thing that I just thought of when you were saying about like the um making things up you know and, and what's your responsibility to like or keep you know if it's only been told to you like you could you could you could ignore it you can come up with your own thing or um there was a, a book a review that I think was in the um contextual links it was in the New York Times and it was written by an author whose whose short stories we read the um how to pronounce knife and it was a very negative review of this book and one of the things that um she was criticizing was this idea of like if you're always talking about ghosts and you're not remembering things clearly then like it like it that i think she called it vacuous you know that that's like you could be saying anything and and i felt like the reviewer had completely missed the point of the book but also reiterated 
to the reader of the review the point of the book like yeah exactly so but I think the, the review um the review kind of bothered me because I felt like she was everything that the reviewer was saying was like yes and that's that's the book that's why it's constructed the way it is not I felt like the reviewer was just missing it but it, um it's I just wanted to bring that up because that, that review has stuck with me where I'm like but I think that what you're saying is what she was trying to do. I don't know. I mean, I think that comes down to the question of, would you rather have this version or nothing at all? Because if you wanted like a compre comprehensive version of it, we just talked about all the reasons why you're not going to be able to do it because the lack of primary resources and things being erased and, you know, like literal wars destroying all records and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> people you no longer have access to. Um, so in which case I'm like, I would much rather have this. I'm glad that this ex family history exists in a written form for me to consume and learn a little bit about the Bamar experience than never to have anything at all. And I feel like I would, uh, I would have felt the same way about how to pronounce knife as well. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that the, her entire tone through the whole book is so reserved, even when she's talking about things that have really bothered her, you know, and I, I feel this kind of, um, this kind of lingering animosity and resentment towards a lot of things. And I enjoyed that. Um, and I, sometimes I think it's more effective than just coming out and lashing out or being really mad about something. I, I think she really can draw the reader in, in an effective way. Um, but there is a kind of reserved tone, I thought, through the whole book. And, you know, even for things that were horrible happening, you know, everything that happens to her and she's moving all the time. And anyway, I, I thought it was so interesting let me just say too that when the final chapter begins and she goes to another author's book reading i also kind of enjoyed her frustration with the author who giving the book reading instead of just you know getting on board or enjoying this person's reading you know, I, I could almost see it through her eyes, someone delivering this glib reading, making the audience laugh and sigh and do all these other things. And I could almost see her there in the audience kind of secretly rolling her eyes. And of course, we're all curious who that may have been if it had actually happened and it kind of seemed like it did. But I I appreciated that because Maybe we've all been to some event where someone is holding forth and we kind of think, oh, brother, you know, uh, yeah. anyway, maybe I'm a little spiteful. <laughs> it was also maybe. very interesting. She didn't put a location in that chapter. That was yeah. the only chapter that didn't have a location. <laughs> maybe it was the, the author who gave her the really bad review. <laughs> I don't think so. And now I'm starting rumors. Don't disregard that. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> cool. I just think it's fascinating that um, the author of How to Pronounce Knife um, really wanted specificity mm -hmm. when they also know how difficult it is to nail down specificity um, with any meaningful concept of truth. Like, yeah, you can put a stake in the ground, but who knows if that stake is in clay mud or sand? Like, it's it feels very futile. So, like, what? Yeah, it, it'd be very different if the author did not have that context. Like, viscerally, did not have that con. Oh, sorry, the um reviewer did not have that visceral context. Um, so this is very surprising because even how to pronounce knife, the specificity is it's fiction, but it's in the small details. It's not mm -hmm. in the context setting um and yeah sorry I'm just like now grappling with that too
yeah yeah it just it kind of like and maybe because we had read that that reviewer mm -hmm. book um and yeah it is fiction and so those details could be made up right I mean they are it's fiction yeah but yeah, it yeah. Just, it's it's funny when you when you read something and you um you you like reading it and you take a lot away from it and you're thinking a lot about a book and then you read a review that's like kind of doesn't get it or is that like I just kind of always take it personally yeah you know <laughs> how dare you say that so I think that's why that one review is just so stuck in my mind and then in addition that we read that other author's work and we and I, I mean I liked her stories a lot so yeah you know. They're like in a very negative, like Fatima is always talking about how she wants to see more um, authors in conversation with each other. This is not mm -hmm. the type of conversation I want to see. <laughs> mm -mm. No. Can you imagine? Oh. That's funny. <clears throat> cool. Um, any last thoughts as we come to the top of the hour um, about this book? No, I'm I'm so glad to have um, been able to discuss it because I think it adds um, just a whole other piece to it to kind of see how other people interpret it or understood it because it is a very different format. And um, so I just feel like, I mean, and I always feel this when we have these discussions, but I just feel like the, the reading has now been so enriched for me. So. Um, one of the themes in the book is about community or lack thereof, and I just want to thank the Ann Arbor District Library for creating another little pocket of community. I mean, at least for, I think I can speak on behalf of me and Fatima, but also all of the readers who um, are still relying on virtual engagement. Um, this is incredibly special and uh, I think is a really powerful tool in helping readers both uh, expand the books, but also readers who have specific type, like that would like to read specific types of books, um, feel like they're seen. So uh, I, I just wanna applaud the library for constantly putting on really incredible programming virtually and in person. And it definitely ties back to one of the main themes of this book, which is how do you feel secure in self if you have no one around you to help affirm that? Yeah, she actually puts a statistic in there, the one that I'm familiar with that um, racism uh, like causes all these adverse effect, health effects on an individual if they don't have community or some like some sense of community and to have have a sense of community and a sense of belonging like gives you the resilience and the resources, the reserves necessary for that um, just to live through that. So yes doubling down on it. Hi. Yes, hi. It's your first appearance on the first the Ann Arbor recordings. <laughs> he also loves book club. So this is also community for her. Oh good. Yeah. Um I also wanna say for uh for that I really came to appreciate the craft in this book. I wasn't ready for, for it towards like the beginning, but then by the end of it, I was just like, wow, this has so many layers to it. The It is so intentional. It is so thoughtfully done and crafted. And, and you could really get a sense of like how the author just like layers upon layers of um, meaning it behind the text itself and just just the way it was it wasn't just a story that was written it was not just an oral history written down you know um, it, it, it there's a lot of great literary techniques and craft in it too and I really appreciated it I'm always so grateful when I have a chance to to take part in these I like Lucy I, I get so much out of discussing these books and it's it's really wonderful Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this. Uh, next month, we're reading The Verifiers by Jane Peck. It's a mystery novel. Um, it should be it should be really fun and good, like a light lighter read uh, for July. Yeah, I'm excited for that one. Yeah. Cool. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.
Bye.